Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Nadine Andrews, and um, I'm chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance in Scotland. And as Joe said, this event has been organised by the CPA. If you're not already familiar with the CPA, um, you can find out about us on our website, <clears throat> and the link will be posted in the chat. So I'm thrilled <laughs> to welcome you all to this first interdisciplinary climate psychology summit where we will be exploring some key themes in climate psychology, climate distress, trauma and resilience, threat responses and organizations, and ecological grief and nature connection. So there's four main sessions on these four topics. Now, of course, there are threads that interlink these themes, and maybe you'll find uh, something that will weave itself together for you over the course of the day. I'll also be drawing out some connections um, between the talks and the sessions, which which I, I'm making myself. We don't have any particular outcomes that we want from the day. Uh, this is an exploration and it's an experiment. <clears throat> so let's just see what emerges uh, when we bring <clears throat> the spirit of curiosity and openness, as Joe has just invited us to do. We hope and we're sure that it will be an enriching experience. Maybe you'll end up with more questions uh, than what you started with. Maybe you'll get ideas for new areas to explore or approaches to take or make connections between things in unexpected ways. Maybe you'll feel unsettled. This is all good. So we have 15 speakers who will be presenting and discussing around these, these topics. And uh, I'm as intrigued and as excited as, as you are to hear what they've got to say and to see what spontaneously emerges through their interactions with each other. I will not be introducing each speaker with their bios, that takes too long, um, but there is information in the programme um, with links to their website, so look there if you want to find out more about them and their work. Um, and as I said, the PDF programme has been posted to the chat, so that includes the biogs and the revised timings for today. Um, together, the speakers bring a fascinating mix of perspectives, expertise and experiences, and we're extremely grateful that they have agreed to contribute in this way uh, to the summit. We are also not having Q&A after the sessions, but as you've heard from Joe, following each set of speakers, we've got facilitated breakout rooms. And then to end the summit, we've got um, 30 minutes <clears throat> at the end, which is a whole group discussion where people can share whatever it is that's calling them to share. And that will be hosted by Judith Anderson, who's the chair of the Climate Psychology Alliance. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that too. And that's, you know, that's a very kind of open um, part of the day. So welcome to the first session in the Climate um, Psychology Summit. And this session is focusing on climate distress. Um, and we're going to begin with um, with Caroline Hickman, who's going to be presenting some findings from a global study on climate anxiety in young people, including um, findings relating to government portrayal and moral injury. Then we're going to hear from Gareth Morgan and Garrett Barnell, who will be applying the, the power threat meaning framework to the study with a focus on institutional betrayal. And we're also delighted that Jennifer Chendu and Eloise Mayo will be joining the session to share their reflections as well. So, um, climate distress uh, as the topic for this session is a key message in climate psychology. And um, that feeling distress is, can be interpreted as a sign that you're in touch with the reality of the crisis. So I would like to now hand over to Caroline. Um, and take it away into the first session, Caroline. Thank you, Nadine. And thank you, everybody, for this amazingly organized, rich day. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Please ignore my slightly messy desktop while I get this done. So I'm going to present our research findings, climate anxiety in children and young people, 
and their beliefs about government responses to climate change, a global survey. And I'm ever so happy to be able to say that we got through the proofs stage yesterday. So we're finally through the peer review process with the Lancet Planetary Health. Uh, so we will be published hopefully in the next couple of weeks. So we're really thrilled about that. So this is research that we conducted into young people and children's feelings, thoughts, the impact on their daily life and correlation with government action and inaction on climate change. And I just want to preface this by saying this, I am presenting numbers and I'm presenting numbers about feelings and trying to do that with feeling and with respect for feeling because numbers, this is both devastating and impersonal at the same time. What I think would be utterly devastating is if we couldn't bear this um, and couldn't tolerate the feelings that 10,000 children and young people have shared with us. So I want to start by also acknowledging the responsibility of the researchers to do this with care and do this with respect and dignity and to honour and thank all the young people and children who've shared their distress with us. It might have been data collected by a polling company. So in that respect, it's a little bit impersonal that I'm presenting and I'm trusting Eloise and Jennifer to make it much more personal and relatable in a minute. But we are also very aware of how personal this is, both to the children and to us. And these children have shared their hurt with us. So it may be in the form of numbers, but it is, it is also personal. So we conducted research through a poll with 10,000 children and young people aged 16 to 25 in these countries. Australia, Brazil, Finland, France, India, Nigeria, the Philippines, Portugal, the UK and the US. And we found eight out of 10 children and young people across the world, so this is the world statistic, told us that they were worried that climate change is threatening people and the planet. And 45% of that group reported negative impact on daily functioning which included, and we didn't break this down in detail, but it included eating, concentrating, going to work, going to school, sleeping, spending time in nature, playing, having fun, relationships. In the UK, this was 28%, so lower than the global average. But if we look at the figures for Nigeria, it's 66%. And then if we look at the figures for the Philippines, it's 74%. So that tells us a lot about the impact in some countries. This is what it looks like briefly, and I'm not going to go through numbers in massive detail, but this is what it looks like. And so there we've got India, Philippines, Nigeria, Brazil, much greater impact on daily functioning, daily life, relationships, being able to play, have fun, study, just have life really. And obviously much lower in the UK, the US, Finland. So feelings, we asked, what, what does climate change make you feel? And this is the worldwide statistics. 67% said sad, 67% said afraid, 62% said anxious. Like I said, not going through them all, we don't have time, so I'm giving you I don't want to call them highlights, low lights. If we look at the UK, interestingly, lower impact on daily functioning, but very similar impact in terms of emotion to the global average, 63% sad, 62% afraid, 60% anxious. So the emotional impact being felt by the children and young people in the UK, very similar to the global average. If we look at Nigeria, not that different, 62% sad, 66 afraid, 66 anxious. There are other differences, which we can do another day. And then we go to the Philippines. 91% sad, 90% afraid, 83% anxious. 
it's terrible, it's wrong. This is not right. None of this is right. Then we asked about thoughts and thinking. How does this impact on your capacity to think and what you think about yourself and your future? And over half of this 10,000 young people and children thought as they think they won't have access to the same opportunities their parents had, the average 55% worldwide, 53% UK, 49% Nigeria, and then 71% Philippines. We asked about family security. Do you think your security will be threatened? 52 worldwide, 39 UK. We're not facing the immediate physical impact of climate changes. Other countries like Nigeria and the Philippines are 77% Philippines, 55% Nigeria. Will the things you most value be destroyed? 55 worldwide, 47 UK, 56 Nigeria, 74 Philippines. I presented this data at a webinar in the Philippines a month ago, and I had I apologize after every slide. Eight out of 10 people think that people have failed to take care of the planet. 83% worldwide, 80% UK, 76 Nigeria, 92 Philippines. Three quarters or more think that the future is frightening. 75% worldwide, 73 UK, 70 Nigeria, 92% Philippines. Four out of 10 hesitant to have children because of climate change. You can see the figures. And then over half of this 10,000 children, young people think that humanity is doomed. 56% worldwide average, very close in the UK. 42 Nigeria. 73% Philippines. If we think that's bad, I think it gets worse now. Children and young people reported to us they've been dismissed or ignored by other people when they try to talk about climate change. Worldwide and in the UK, this is 48%. Nigeria, 66%. Philippines, 51%. That we could do something about tomorrow or today. So then we look for correlation with government and government action and inaction. And these are the UK respondents. 65% thought that governments were failing young people, 61 lying about impact of their action, 28% thought government could be trusted, 27% thought the government was taking the concerns and the needs of young people seriously, 57% thought that they were feeling betrayed. So out of this, we're noticing young people and children are telling us that they feel betrayed by governments worldwide and in the UK. And this comes with an anguish and abandonment, fear, anger, feeling ashamed, feeling belittled, unimportant. And there is hope. Young people feel reassured, valued, validated, hopeful, protected, if we listen to them and take their concerns seriously. I can't help but be thinking about what happened at COP last week. This is the group of researchers involved, six different universities, researchers from Finland, the US, Canada, the UK, psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, ecologists. And we're linking this to moral injury. And we're linking this to the case of six children and young people in Portugal taking 33 European governments to court for failure to act on climate change. It's the, in the middle of the court case at the moment. These young people in Portugal are already experiencing record-breaking heat waves and forest fires on a scale never seen before. Without urgent measures taken to keep fossil fuels in the ground, their generation faces a future dominated by these deadly weather extremes. So these young people are adding their voice to the global fight for justice. They told me, we've tried asking nicely and it hasn't worked. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Gareth and Gareth. Thank you, Caroline. That's such a um, powerful study and, and, and we really, um, I mean, it's a powerful study for many different reasons, but we really value the um, 
the linking of distress with uh, government inaction as well. That, that's really important. We're trying to link that into the presentation we're, what we're speaking about today. Um, so Garrett and I are grateful to be here to share some of the thinking we've been doing with colleagues on how the power threat meaning framework might provide a useful lens uh, through which to make sense of a whole range of different responses to climate breakdown from denial through to being overwhelmed with distress. But in order to try and link down, link um, up our presentation of what Caroline was speaking about, we're focusing on institutional betrayal, which is very similar to, to moral injury that, that Caroline was speaking about. Um, so the power threat meaning framework was published and funded by the British Psychological Society's Division of Clinical Psychology in 2018. So Lucy Johnston and Mary Boyle were the lead authors of the framework. There's a team of around 40 people, including a third of whom who would have lived experience of accessing mental health services. And the Power Threat Meaning Framework is freely available from the BPS website, and we'll, we'll get a link in the chat at some point um, so you have access to that. It was developed as an attempt to outline an alternative to a diagnostic model of distress and unusual experiences. So in, in Western neoliberal societies, the diagnostic approach to mental health is the dominant way of thinking about mental health. But it's got a problematic evidence base and a problematic tendency to make sense of all forms of distress and distressing experiences of symptoms of mental disorders and evidence base that's been well critiqued. So instead, the PTMF support, it aims to, to support mental health professionals to recognize that emotional distress and behavior are ultimately understandable responses to a person's history, their circumstances, and positions within complex networks of oppression, privilege, and power. The original uh, framework didn't contain any direct reference to um, the climate crisis, and Garrett's and colleagues' papers was, was the first, we think, to, to link the PTMF uh, in, in a case study and making sense of the experiences of people in a mine affected, mine affected community in South Africa. Since then, I've been linked in with Garrett and, and we've got a paper coming up, coming out um, early, early next year and um, trying to think about how the Power Fact Meaning Framework could be used to think about responses to distress more broadly, uh, written with, with other psychology and psychiatry colleagues, including uh, Lucy Johnston, one of the, the lead authors of the framework. So the PTMF, it, it's, it's quite a long document and it's quite difficult to explain in such a short, a short space of time. So just trying to give a very quick overview of what the Power Threat Meaning Framework is and how it's structured. So the Power Threat Meaning Framework is kind of structured around the sort of five questions you can, the six questions you can see on the slide. So the PTMF centers power, power's in the middle there. It aims to reorientate mental health professionals from asking what is wrong with you to what has happened to you considering how different forms of power might have operated negatively on a person or community's life. So the negative operations of power result in threats to our abilities to meet our core human needs. So it's hypothesized that there are some core universal human needs we all share, such as the need to feel loved, safe, secure, valued, to get our needs for food, shelter, water met. So when power operates negatively on our abilities to get these needs met, we in turn respond with threat responses things we do to mitigate the negative operations of power. So a lot of these, these threat responses would be regarded as symptoms under sort of Western neoliberal approaches to mental health. But here they're reframed as a survival strategy. You're doing thinking. it, are you? You're doing it, are you? Well, I think someone's got their, their audio unmuted. Um, yeah, yeah. The, there isn't a straightforward relationship between power and the threat responses that the people have for a number of reasons, one of which is that the, the response we take is mediated by meaning, the sense we come to make of the, the, the negative operation of power. Although, although power, threat and meaning are list, and threat responses are listed as separate domains, they're all interconnected. We can't think about power without thinking about threats, and we can't think about the threats without thinking about the meaning that, that the person attributes to them, and so on. This is a very wordy slide and I'm not going to read uh, the, all of the different forms of power out uh, and power is a contested topic, but power in the PTMF uh, framework is, is, is defined as the means of obtaining security and advantage for oneself or loved ones. 
um, and being able to influence your own environment to meet your own needs and interests and, and, and the interests of, of loved ones. So this is one taxonomy of power. This is one way of dividing up power. It's, it, it's pretty much taken from the power front meaning framework, just adapted slightly to think about how it relates to the climate crisis. So have time to speak to the different examples of the forms of power and some are more obvious than others. So the top one, coercive power or power by force, that's quite readily recognizable but by many people as a form of power. But the one we will speak a bit about more today is ideological power, the one at the bottom. And this is because it's, it's regarded as one of the most important forms of power because it interlinks with all other forms of power and directly relates to control of meaning. It's often harder to spot because when it's operating well, it, its effects are masked. We come to accept that this is the way the world is meant to be. It operates in multiple ways around, climate, about around the climate crisis, and Garrick's going to speak uh, to a couple of examples that link this to institutional betrayal. Thanks very much, Gareth, and thank you for Caroline for those uh, dramatic statistics. I'm going to just speak to institutional betrayal from a Southern African perspective, and um, it's one interpretation of the moment that we find ourselves in. So I'm sharing this picture as representing modernity's political ideology. And to illuminate this, I draw on the decolonial theorist, Walter Mignolo. In this picture, you see a specific white actor who is enunciating a certain way of thinking, sensing, and being in the world. Emerging through colonialism, this rhetoric of modernity is underpinned by an extractive logic that presents a Euro-American Euro pathway to progress, development, and security for the world. Modernity's rhetoric is inherently violent and it privileges whiteness while subjugating, silencing, excluding, or invisibilizing other ways of being in the world. These white, and to be clear, historically male actors have also defined, based on their own identities, who is human and who is deemed inferior. Today, these patriarchal logics is what racism, sexism, and classism founded upon. Modernity is realized through language, governance structures, educational institutions, and economic systems such as capitalism, which operationalizes the exploitation of life. Wealth is thus accumulated by appropriating and destituting other life, ways of being and belonging uh, to threats. <clears throat> so South Africa is the extreme example of where white supremacy took hold. Today, those historically privileged by the racist apartheid state have some means to adapt to the climate emergency, while the vast majority of black South Africans face extraordinary barriers to daily survival. According to the IPCC, many areas in the global south, including South Africa, are already experiencing double the rates of global warming. This we know is leading to increased droughts, wildfires, wildfires and storm surges are displacing people, destroying livelihoods, and threatening other ways of knowing and being in the world. Although South Africa is the 12th major emitter, climate change is not something most South Africans have caused. Yet many South Africans are on the front lines of resistance against coal projects and face brutal violence from the modernity's proponents. For instance, Fakile Nchengasi was killed a year ago defending... <laughs> Uh, someone's unmuted. So these, these multinational industries are the new colonial outposts. They're on the ranks of some of the top 100 polluters. What is clear are grotesque climate injustices, material, political, and ethical, that present daily threats to survival. And despite modernity's veil being lifted, World leaders, particularly those in the global north, continue undermining justice. So, two meaning. Thanks, Gareth. So, making sense of the moment that we're in, Shotty explains that meaning is made and found, and it is shaped by ideological power. Unlike most Western psychologies, meaning is not understood in terms of cognitions alone, and we are not free to interpret events as we please. Meaning is constrained by society's dominant discourses, including those by modernity's proponents that actively contribute to climate emergency, watering down threats, invalidating excluding voices, 
and in visualizing the suffering of the global south. As we make meaning of this moment, I would like to draw upon the concept of institutional betrayal. Fried describes institutional betrayal as the wrongdoing perpetrated by institution upon individuals who depend on that institution, including failure to prevent or respond supportively to wrongdoings by individuals and institutions. Institutional betrayal was first used in relationship to climate distress by Professor Lisa von Sistren in her expert report for Juliana versus the United States. I've also similarly used it in a youth-led climate litigation launched this week against our government by three South African civil society organizations and um, the concept of moral injury that Caroline also speaks of in the Portugal case. However, may not only be experienced in relationship to the contradictions of our local government, we are largely dependent on to meet our needs. A sense of institutional betrayal extends to the understanding that global North governments and multinationals who have historically benefited from colonialism continue to thwart human rights, climate reparations, while also continuing to invest in fossil fuels. I'd also like to emphasize that we as mental health care professionals can further contribute to the sense of institutional betrayal by depoliticizing or decontextualizing distress. For instance, psychologizing experiences of anger, betrayal, and feelings of injustice, or individualizing climate anxiety, and then neglecting that these experiences are mediated by negative operations of power, including how violence is operationalized through global political networks. Thanks very much, Gary. Thanks, Garrett. So, so the, the, the negative operations of power cause threats to our, our, our core needs and then we, we experience meaning in relation to them and the sense of institutional betrayal that, that, that Garrett was speaking to and, and, and the, the, the feelings of the, the young people globally that, that Caroline was speaking to um, lead us to respond with threat responses, things we do to, to mitigate against the negative operations of power. Again, a wordy slide that I won't speak to. So some of these threat responses, again, are things that risk being framed as symptoms by professionals in the global north, such as low mood, anxiety. As Garrett was saying, so the risk that we, we come to sort of see these things as, as a problem within the individual and not attending to the actual context within, within the, which these, these, these feelings are responses to, that are valid responses to. Um, and they're here they're seen as serving a particular function. So we've grouped them by functions here. So the functions that might relate to responding to institutional betrayal might, might relate to the first two rows, you know, responses that are about regulating overwhelming feelings, trying to maintain a sense of control and agency. Um, the threat responses we respond with are gonna be moderated by culture because different responses are seen as more or less socially acceptable by culture, but also in terms of power resources, taking climate activism in the form of litigation as both Garrett and Caroline were speaking about, requires a certain level of power that not everybody has access to. And it's one of the ways that we as professionals can support people to be more empowered. Um, finally, it's also important to acknowledge that whilst all responses are understandable to, to climate breakdown, it's a trauma impacting upon all of us and all responses are understandable. Not all of the responses on this slide are equally uh, valid or useful. So some of these responses are actually damaging for the planet. Some of the responses can cause some benefits for people, but they can also cause more threats. So taking part in climate activism can have benefits, but there can also be some, some negative effects and feelings of moral injury or, or, or being devalued that leads to, lead to further threats that people have to, have to, have to deal with. So in conclusion, um, we hope that the PTMF um, can provide a useful lens for, for people to make sense of their experiences in relation to, to climate trauma uh, and in a way that will support us in doing so, making sense of our own responses and other people's responses in ways that centre power and connect personal experiences and neg negative operations of power. And in doing so, encourage engagement in collective social action that may support climate uh, justice goals. The problem isn't the distress in the individual. The problem is that we need to be supporting people to take uh, action to or to get, our, to get our, our world leaders to actually be doing what they, they should be doing. So stop there. Thank you. There's some references as well. Um, 
that, that will also be available in the, the final article. I think we're handing over now to, to Jennifer and Eloise who are going to be reflecting on their reactions to these videos. Hello, thank you uh, for both those talks. Um, particularly, uh, so, a bit of context and introduce myself. My name is Eloise. Um, I am in the day a, an ecology student at the University of East Anglia and I'm also a member of the UK Youth Climate Coalition in the UK. Um, and I am a co-author of the paper of Caroline, um, which put me quite an interesting position, being both part of the age group, um, which was being interviewed and surveyed, um, as well as someone who's researching the data. Jennifer, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Eloise. And hi, everyone um, joining in. My name is Jennifer Uchendu. I'm Nigerian. And um, I'm also the founder of a youth network um, on climate change called Susty Vibes, um, where I work with young people to drive community action on sustainability. And um, I've also been recently involved in eco-anxiety research, um, being personally impacted by eco-anxiety as it were, and just wanting to know more about the feelings I was experiencing and how I can support uh, more young people in Nigeria. Um, and so today we're just going to sort of go through our reflections on, on what's been said uh, and also to highlight maybe the different ways in which climate anxiety, eco anxiety can be different depending on your backgrounds, where you're from. It's um, not just anxiety, it is a range of different emotions, um, often swapping between lots of those different emotions. Um, I'll start if that's okay, Jennifer. I, I similarly got interested in researching eco anxiety by having it myself. Um, it was probably when I was 21, 24 now, um, I was at the time feeling very, very intense eco anxiety. I didn't have the language to describe it then, but what it felt like, it kind of built slowly. It was me moving from my university, which was a very happy green space and everyone supporting each other to a kind of much more isolating workspace and realizing that a lot of people still didn't care about climate. And I, my naive little green bubble was burst. And so in response, I started to become um, hypervigilant to my personal actions and my personal ways of impacting the planet, particularly with this idea that I need to mitigate those around me who weren't doing enough. And so I place a lot of um, intense personal responsibility on my own individual action and a lot of minimizing. Um, and the Gareth and Garrett's talk about not all the responses to eco stress is particularly helpful, can be kind of damaging. This was the point where I found with hindsight a bit damaging to myself because I stopped finding joy in lots of little day-to-day -day things, my daily impact, my daily functioning was being impacted. I was questioning, oh, can I do this? Can I do that? It's not fair for me to drive. Why should I feel, um, drive and see my friend? That's not fair, other people are going underwater. I need to do more, This I'm not doing enough. Why is it fair that I'm going to be potentially okay when I know so many of my peers aren't going to be? So there's a lot of guilt and shame in my personal um, experiences of intense eco anxiety. Jennifer, what about you? Thanks, Louis. Um, always interesting to hear from you and your experience on, of eco anxiety. And I guess what's um, slightly different from my experience is that rather than guilt and shame, there's more of a feeling of overwhelm and anger, being that I'm on the other side of the spectrum, being from the global south, and really knowing that. Um, we haven't gotten there yet in terms of development, so we're still struggling with unemployment, poverty, hunger, and then the climate crisis just sort of makes it really complicated and complex. So it's as a young person standing from, you know, my position saying, how did we get here? How do we have to grab? with all of these issues at the same time and in the face of that still realizing that our governments don't even see what's happening or don't see what's coming when you have you know government leaders who aren't even talking about the trends who aren't talking about climate solutions it's really infuriating and it just feels like you've been set up you know for failure from bed you've just been put in a really disadvantaged position and um, I would always say that um, my experience of eco anxiety sort of climaxed at COP25 which was the previous COP because you know I thought it was such a good opportunity to be with world leaders and listen to all of their interesting plans about um, the climate crisis and I just 
found myself being so numb and wanting to cry every single time listening to these world leaders because that sense of urgency wasn't there because I would say I'm going back to Nigeria to you know experience flooding to see how people would suffer from food insecurity like this realities with us already why don't you sound like you're bothered and that is where that eco anxiety really fueled in for me and that anger started to boil it but of course I, I knew that, uh, of course, with more study, I knew that it wasn't the problem about me. Like I was, it was okay to feel overwhelmed and angry, but what do I do with that anger? But really going to the root cause of that overwhelm, that anxiety and that anger and really thinking about, thinking about it with other young people in Nigeria, just as the survey, you know, really exposed to say, yes, we do think our future is doomed, we do, we've really lost um, trust or hope in our governments. We want something radical. We're asking for, you know, an uproot of the system and really new thinkings to, to the way we, we, we operate and do business. And finally, just to touch on what Garrett mentioned, that we cannot take away, you know, this extracting and colonial history of the climate crisis from, you know, how we experience it, how, we, how it's impacted, and even how the solution come up because I remember at COP25 being asked to speak at some events and you know being said oh we're happy you're here from the global south but would only give you two minutes one minute 30 seconds and I'm like what is happening here what idea of inclusion is this this is a crisis that is impacting me disproportionately and your idea of inclusive inclus inclusion is really really unfair so it's all of this put together that often comes out in you know why we feel eco-anxious and I know it's okay I know it's how we drive action because going back to Nigeria I just became more and more interested in supporting young people let's do more let's go out let's build hope and really really have active hope as much as possible yeah, yeah. no I mean so by coincidence we were both at COP26 just <laughs> last few weeks ago as well and that was my first COP and I, I came in again thinking um well whilst I was there I was having an amazing time because we were part of a youth group and there's a lot of understanding of how emotionally tumultuous working in that space is and there's a lot of support within the youth group and also the other civil society groups of understanding that it's emotionally exhausting working in such a space but that numbness at the end when I was hearing all the final things I cried <laughs> because again similar to you the lack of urgency after the lack of anything significant after listening and learning so much about people from the global south and indigenous communities and being really open to their distress and their their need for that dramatic change that we know we need is possible it's possible we can do it we have the solutions and then hearing the global leaders just move an inch rather than moving a mile I was felt betrayed similarly to what we were talking about in yeah. in the paper and I'm sure you probably felt a similar thing too and just after COP I think my eco anxiety definitely dropped very significantly um, before it had been quite a, like a workable manageable level I was in sort of an equilibrium with it I felt managed like I could manage it but after being so open to all the stories and the feelings of those who most need action and then again looking up to the people who are supposed to be looking after us and supporting us and are meant to be sort of the most powerful intelligent people of the world and then just not delivering for what we need right now really hurts it really really hurt and I definitely struggled a few days afterwards and with hindsight I recognize oh that was a big eco anxiety <laughs> drop which I hadn't experienced it that deep for years and um it was yeah very quite odd again being one of the researchers paper and almost like tech like checklist yes there was dismissal there was um betrayal like all these things that we just researched um just being felt again and it was yeah it's just peculiar and it's quite bizarre and I, i'm wondering if what if especially between your two cops did you feel a difference between the two or um was this cop felt different to you from the previous one or was it just all the same situation repeating it well, I, th I think it's the same because 
you think you have you know some form of control and then the more you you're exposed to what leaders are doing or what they're saying i get i guess the closer you are to seeing the information and you know being there it's more it's acute it's right in your face and you're just like how is this possible you know you want to scream i, I remember getting dms from you know young youth activists from nigeria who were cop saying I've been crying, you know, I can't just stop crying. It's just ridiculous being here, you know, thinking that you're, this is where all of the really great solutions and decisions will be made. And just going back with nothing. But I, I guess what COP25 and, you know, really studying about eco anxiety did for me was that I went into COP26 not expecting so much from leaders. You know, the betrayal has been consistent. Why would I expect it to be, you know, radical, you know, this year? So it's, it's, it's knowing that. But then I guess what was really, really devastating for me was just not recognizing the loss and damage that comes with the climate crisis. We've been speaking about this for so long, the injustice that is intertwined, the fact that people are not suffering in the same way, we do not have the safety nets to cope through, lives are being changed, futures are being altered and damaged, and that's what's unfair, that's what's difficult to, to sort of wrap around, and that, that came out for me at COP26, because I'm like, wow, we're really on our own, you know, we really need to find a way to, you know, live through this, um, to live through this. And I guess um, with this year, I found out that it was okay and possible to live with the sadness of everything going on, but also the joy of seeing all of the climate protests, you know, the communities coming together, the people summit, and all of that organizing also gave me hope, you know, it gave me so much ideas of how we can work with more and more, you know, civil societies back in Nigeria, hold our hands together and really push through. It also gave me that sense of this is a marathon. This is something I'm going to be doing for a very long time. And we have to encourage more and more young people to join the fight because that's the only way we only have to. It's the only way. Otherwise, we'll drown and, um, you know, we, we can still push through. So I guess that was what was different. With COP25, I felt like I drowned. I was just overwhelmed. You know, I was just numb for a couple of days saying, why am I studying sustainable development? Why, why, what is the point of this? Why don't I find something that would, you know, give me, um, you know, a reason to leave rather than this that's all, almost like a suicide mission as it were. So that's, that's where I was, you know, this year in comparison. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I, I completely agree and resonate with that, particularly the, the joy felt with the civil society and the kind of outside movements that were going on. And I found that that sense of community and camaraderie and support really helped with the eco anxiety or the fear or the rage or the sadness that you're feeling, because I think you felt very held yeah. and understood by this, this community. And people, um, especially after the study, kind of ask me, say, oh, what can we do about eco-anxiety? And I, I generally sort of give the suggestion that finding a community can really support and validate your feelings. Um, for me personally, I think, and for a lot of people I've talked to, it's one of the most helpful things. Um, and that understanding that it's okay to be upset, it's okay to have all your guilt and shame, it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a, it means you care, um, and you don't want to numb yourself to that, but also understanding that movements need to be sustainable and this actually needs to be sustainable. And I see that a lot with maybe the younger activists are kind of coming yeah. and burn too bright and kind of burn out really quickly because there's so much urgency and desperation, but they haven't quite yet learned how to emotionally be resilient to such a tumultuous space. And I think that's something I really learned through the two weeks there, just how important it is to have that community who can support you, particularly when your leaders aren't. And just knowing that someone has your back um, to look out for you, as I thought was one of the biggest takeaways I got from it. Yeah, definitely. And that's something I, I want to do a lot more of in Nigeria because, you know, that space has been missing, even globally, space to validate the feelings of equal anxiety. So I remember, you know, after COP, just typing away what you know an eco anxiety plan would look like for Africa, you know, something that's really grounded in our reality that 
you know, very drastically different from the global north. How can we, you know, make something that's culturally relevant, a space that, you know, properly researches these emotions and how we can support young people? Because to be honest, if we don't fix this, we miss that idea of what climate adaptation really would be in the next couple of years, because it all starts in the mind, it all grows in the mind, and this is really, really crucial, so yeah. Yeah, um, I think we're coming to time now. So, I mean, if there's any last comments you'd like to make about maybe the previous things you just talked about. Um, is there anything you'd like to final remarks? This way? Yeah, I mean, just to say um, really, really helpful um, survey. You know, every time I read the article and, and the work that was done with the survey and the emotions, it's real, it's relatable, it's stuff that's the stuff that we see every day, because I have a community with young people who are really enthusiastic about the environment, and they say these things, I'm overwhelmed, I'm angry, I'm exhausted, it's not fair, you know, how can this be okay? So these are real feelings, these are real emotions, and they have to be explored, they have to be researched, and young people have to be, you know, supported. We can definitely move these emotions to action. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Nadine. <laughs> Yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Eloise and Jennifer, just bringing your perspectives and your, your personal reflections as well and experiences. Um, I think it, it really brings that kind of insight to, to the summit today. And it's great to ground it as well in the, in the perspectives of young people and um, bringing in the findings that Caroline was sharing before. And also, um, to, to have this first session also talking about issues of power and different types of power. And that also feels very important for the summit to be grounded in, in these particular topics. So thank you very much. So um, now also um, just in terms of the, the role and the impact of institutions, and um, this is gonna be picked back up again in session three. Um, so what's happening now is that we're gonna go into breakout rooms um, and for those of you who are not in breakout rooms, session two, which is on trauma and resilience, that will start um, at 11.30, so we'll see you back again then. Um,